Uh, I'm going to start at the very beginning because it's important to me now. Uh, my father was a manager of orange groves and uh, real estate in, the, in Texas, South Texas, and in uh, McAllen, Texas, which is in the, has been in the news lately, if you watch the news. And a, what they call in Texas, the Blue Norther came down and killed all the orange trees, and my father planted cotton, and there was a drought, and as a result, there was no income from anything, and no one was buying or selling dead orchards. So uh, my mother talked him into buying a farm in Arkansas, selling out, and moving there. And it was uh, near the Oklahoma border in the, in the central part of Arkansas, and we moved there in February. And Mayor Bobbitt came through a few months. That this is, after we moved there and stayed at Ozark, Arkansas, which was not that far away. And of course, no one, I didn't know, and my parents or anybody knew about Baba for quite some time yet. But I had been to different high schools in different states, and where we lived in Arkansas, the only school was a rural school, and they didn't offer anything that I could take, really. And I talked to the superintendent of the schools, and we tried to figure out what to do with me. And he said, well, I would give you a diploma if you finished senior English somehow, because that was required by the state. So we looked into it, and I got uh, notice of a, of, of a correspondence course in senior English. And the superintendent said, if you take the course and promised to take the course, I'll give you a diploma now, and what would you do? <laughs> so I decided I would like to go to college. I was 17, and I hitchhiked up to Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, crossing Route 64, coming and going, and Bobby had just gone on Route 64, and I went to the dean's office and gave him the diploma that the superintendent gave to me and talked to him for a while and he gave me the paperwork and I started college in the fall at age 17, which was a little early, but that's what I did. And later, after I finished school, I sent letters out to a number of places trying to get a job, teaching job, and this, that was in the spring, and I was in summer school too, but not, no replies happened, not a single one, not even a rejection. And here it was August, and I was getting worried. What was I going to do in the fall? And I went, I bothered the people in the placement office at the school, and they got to know me, and I kept going in, and they would say, Nothing today, Don. <laughs> And uh, finally I went in one day and, and the woman said, Don, call this number. So I did, and it was a, a small college in Oklahoma. And they were looking for somebody to teach government psycholo and psychology. But I was a history major, so I was a little hesitant. And we chatted a while, and I had government courses, and I did have two courses in psychology, but I was not a psychologist by any means. And I said, well, I need a job, and maybe I would come if I could te teach at least one history course. And he thought about it and said, why don't you come and visit us and see what the school is like, and we'll see what you're like, and if I can talk one of the teachers into giving up a history course for you, then we'll see what we can do. So I did that, and I got hired. And it was in what eastern Oklahoma, and guess what ran right near the college, at Route 64, that Baba had taken just, you know, a few years now before. And I got to know the area very well, and this was about the right place to stop uh, when, when you're leaving Ozark, Arkansas, and entering Oklahoma, 
and there isn't too much in the way of uh, gas stations and uh, restaurants and things combined. And I used to cross the road many times to go to the restaurant and I really had the feeling this was an important place. And I figured out later that probably Baba and the Mondeley stopped there on, en route to Prague, Oklahoma. And while I was teaching at that school, uh, 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 the state education part department had a conference in Oklahoma City and we carpooled and we all went to Oklahoma City and we stopped in the morning for coffee and it was at, in Prague, Oklahoma. So I had all this experience of being near Baba and being places where Baba was without knowledge of Baba in, in, in the forefront of my, my mind. And it was very strange because I left soon after that to do other things and my parents left after that and none of the family lived there anymore. It was like we moved there for a purpose and then moved away and I now believe that that purpose, purpose was, was Baba and he was moving me around then and I had no knowledge of it really. Um, and the rest of my life for a few more years went on that way. I went into the Air Force and uh, I managed to get stationed uh, near Washington DC at Andrews Air Force Base and I was sent up for a, a course in, in, on Long Island of New York and I, I went up to New York and it was 1956 and I was walking around the city and I walked near a, a restaurant. Well, it, I didn't know it was a restaurant then, but it said Longchamps. And there wasn't a door, it wasn't like a plate glass window kind of restaurant, it was a dining hall. And I paused there and, and looked and felt, some, you know, there's something here. And I think it was the Longchamps that that the Baba celebrated uh, his coming to America in 56. And when I got back, I, I was sent to Europe for a year, to France and Germany, a year each. And when I got back, it was 1958, and I went to New York, and I felt the presence of something there too, and I didn't know what it was. And I went back to Arkansas and decided that I didn't want to live there anymore and I happened to meet somebody through another friend and moved to New York and I didn't take all my belongings with me and on the way back to Arkansas to get them uh, my friends took a trip down the east coast of, of the United States and when people asked me where did you go the only place I remembered was Myrtle Beach and we had taken 17 all the way down the coast, passing the center, and then went down to the, uh, uh, the Gulf and went to New Orleans and came back and went back to New York City. Uh, and I experienced New York City and at first I met authors and uh, um, actors and, uh, and people who were very creative and it was very exciting being in a city, but I soon tired of it and I was looking for something else and uh, I had done many things and tried many things and they were okay but uh, I knew there was something else and I used to drive my friends crazy. What is this for? What does this mean? Where are we going? Why? And most of my friends really didn't think of that very much but I did and I wanted to do something about it and it was the ferment of the 60s, now it was 1967, and uh, I saw and read about people taking LSD, not to escape, but for spiritual purposes, and they recommended trying it and, and you would get a greater understanding of our purpose. And someone said, well, I know this, this uh, doctor of English lit, at a college who has taken LSD and maybe he could help you. 
And so I got the telephone number and I called the number and I said, this is Don and someone told me that you had taken LSD and I'm interested in maybe finding out about it. And, and he said, I'll be right over, what's your address? And I told him the address and he, and just within an hour he came and I, the bell rang and I opened the door and, and this man stood there with the biggest grin on his face you ever saw and he said, I have what you want, Mayor Baba. And I was just, I felt this quickening in my gut, didn't know what it meant. I thought maybe it was the same thing that happened to Scrooge. When he saw the ghost of Marley, and he said, it's, it's a bit of beef or underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about this. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just maybe my imagination. But after that, my life started to change. And he gave me a little card of Baba, and I put that up on the, on the, on the wall, and I would look at it. And, and then he came and he kept coming back and he gave me a big poster of I am the Ancient One of Baba with the beard and I put that on the wall and I felt the eyes follow me around as I moved around in the apartment and I just, I, I, I became fascinated with that pic picture of Baba and uh, it became real to me almost and I you know, what did I know about perfect masters and all of this, and I knew nothing. Uh, but my life changed and I quit my job and I went up to my little house in the mountains and decided that I would stay there until I found out what life was really for and about. And I took I Am the Ancient One with me. And uh, while I was there, uh, I had friends from uh, uh, Columbia University where I'd gotten my degree in library science and they were in different uh, fields. One was in anthropology and sociology and this English lit and this and that. And we became friendly and they bought a house, no, rented a house on Cape Cod and I visited them in the summer. And it was a very diverse group of people. Uh, there was a, a man who had lived in uh, Greece in a cave for a while, and there were gays and straights and everybody mixed together, and we all uh, communally bought food and cooked. And it, it was, to me, it was an eye-opener that people could live together uh, and love one another of all sorts and accept one another, what, whatever they were like and whatever they did. And it was a wonderful experience. And they did uh, LSD, but I had to leave uh, because other people were coming. So I didn't participate uh, because I didn't want to try to drive back home <laughs> stone, <laughs> And I didn't know what LSD would do. So they agreed to, when they left Cape Cod to come to my house uh, in the mountains on the, uh, afterwards. So one morning in, in September, they came to my house and we all slept in where we could in, in my little house. And the next morning at the breakfast table, we were all gathered around. They brought out the LSD and I took LSD. And at first it was just, kind of, uh, it revealed the subtle nature of everything That's, and it was kind of interesting but not terribly revealing. And it was in late August, early September, I don't remember the exact date, but up in the Berkshires it starts getting cool at night at that time of the year and I didn't have much firewood so I got the wheelbarrow and said, we're going out to the woods to get some firewood. So all of us went out and uh, started picking it up. And all of a sudden, there was this amazing presence that we all felt. And it didn't bother me. I kind of welcomed it. But it, it really bothered some of the other people. And they, what, what is this? What's happening? And uh, I was very close to Peggy, a woman 
who was my friend, and she says, I'm afraid. And I took her hand and we walked to a pine tree and lay down and I said, there's nothing to be afraid of. And Baba, I think, I don't know because I had no experience that, took over everything. And the other people were afraid and they left, but Peggy and I stayed there. And suddenly uh, I felt my whole body change and all my chakras were were opened and I felt energy zip out of my head and zip out of every uh, chakra and it was the most uh, amazing experience and uh, suddenly I heard a bell chime bing and I disappeared and I went into a void somewhere and I was like in the sleep state. The, when I came to it was dark and Peggy and I were in the woods with the wheelbarrow with wood, not knowing where to go. <laughs> and there was a star in the sky and I said, we'll take the wheelbarrow and take it and it will lead us by the star and get back home. And it did. <laughs> and we, uh, I built a fire and we all sat around the fire and uh, I went to uh, use the bathroom, which was inside then, uh, and there was a, a mirror, and I looked in the mirror and I realized that I wasn't real, that none of this was real, that this was all a dream, and that there was a way out, and there was somebody in control, and I felt very peaceful. And I sensed maybe it's Mayor Baba. And uh, very soon after that, I, I received a, a call from Bruce, and he said, I'm, I'm coming up your way. Uh, is there a phone that I could call you on if I get to your area? Well, I had a neighbor who was. Uh, French professor at the University of Massachusetts and I gave his number and thought that he might take a message for me and he invited Peggy and me to dinner and the phone rang while we were there and it was Bruce Hoffman and he said I'm at I'm in Pittsfield come over and see it see it didn't, didn't realize that Pittsfield was hours away so I said, Bruce, I, I can't do that. And he said, well, I wanted to tell you more about Mayor Baba. Mayor Baba is having a darshan and for his lovers, and I thought you might want to go to that and be interested in it. And I said, well, maybe I, I am, and we'll talk later. And I felt this vibration come over the telephone that came into me, and it was just overwhelming. I felt the, in, it's hard to put into words, the enormity, the power, the grace of God, and I fell to the floor, prostate, and uh, I felt it's here. It was just overwhelming. I knew that Mayor Baba was God and it's here, whatever it was. And from then on, I got more and more involved uh, with Baba. I went to meetings and uh, I went down to New York and I met Fred and Ella Winterfeld and went to their apartment. And Ella had showed me a, a poster of, don't worry, be happy, of Baba the big poster and I grabbed it. <laughs> I said, I want this. And I took it, and never thinking that it was something you probably had to pay for. <laughs> it, just, uh, it just was so magical to me, and I've loved that, that picture of Baba ever since. And I did start to find out about the, the trip to India, and uh, I didn't know if I could afford to go or not, and I wanted to go, but I didn't have enough money. 
But then suddenly I thought, while I was working a little t before they were taking out every month a certain amount and putting it in a savings account and they would do it automatically and so I wasn't really involved and I totally forgot about it, really totally forgot about it. And I was thinking, where could I get money, where could I get money? And it suddenly came to me that I had this savings account and guess what? It was just enough to cover a trip to India. Uh, and by this time it was winter and I got so excited that I walked to the post office, which was a mile away in a snowstorm where there was a public telephone booth to call and make reservations to go to India. Uh, then a little later, it was still very cold and, and wind, wintry, I decided to go down to New York to get a passport and, and shots and see what one had to do uh, if, you know, to get on the, everything straightened out to go to India. And I got down to New York and I called Bruce Hoffman and he wasn't home and I, I left the number of where I was staying. And the next day he called and said, what would you think of someone who said that they were going to be with you and see you? And then they did and, and they died. And I said, what are you talking about, Bruce? And he said that Mayor Bob had dropped the body. And I thought about it, and I was first a little disappointed because I wanted to see Bob and see what this was all about. Or maybe I thought I would see what it was all about. And then I said something which I truly believed at the time, and I'm glad I believed that. I said to myself, Someone who can awaken such love within me, that love cannot die. And it was kind of an exciting time in New York because no one knew what was going to happen. Bob had said so many things that he would speak and two-thirds of the world would be destroyed and people thought well, any, at any moment he would say the word of all words. and. Uh, this would happen and that would happen and uh, I, I was with Baba people and the discussion was what, what, what would happen and then what about the trip to India, would that be cancelled and we didn't know what was going to happen and uh, the meetings were very tense and people were wondering what's next and we received word uh, that Baba said to the Mandali, go to Pune, we go to Pune at a certain date, and they decided that Baba meant by several other remarks about the darshan would be very easy for him and he could do it lying down and his health didn't matter, that they would go ahead and have the darshan as, as, as Baba planned. And uh, they said people who can come w would be able to come. So uh, I got my passport and uh, everything and was all set to go to India and went back to Massachusetts and did some things and came back down in uh, April to, to go and the beginning of the trip was, was kind of str rather strange because we, the plane was delayed for some reason they had to do something to the engines or something, I don't, I don't really know, but we didn't leave when we were supposed to. Uh, and we stayed in a hotel at Kennedy Airport uh, till the next day. And I had, after I arrived in New York, I was so excited I didn't sleep the first night, nor did I sleep the second night <laughs> in Kennedy Airport because I was, was just so full of energy and waiting for the trip. And I didn't sleep on the plane, and it took about 24 hours to get there. And they had uh, the Indian people who were meeting us. They were very, they were wonderful. They took us in, in a bus to a, a great uh, place on the on the beach in Bombay, uh, and had wonderful food. But I was so excited, I didn't eat any of the food. I just couldn't. I, uh, and I went outside and walked around and of course 
being introduced to India in that way, suddenly all these children were around me <laughs> wanting money and things. And uh, it was uh, an introdu introduction to India. They took us from there to uh, the train station and we got on the Deccan Queen in late afternoon and started up uh, to go to uh, Pune. And it was very hot, and the, air, the, the train was not air conditioned, and it went, you know, kakung, 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 the way trains do it. I fell asleep, and I, because I hadn't slept for three days, and I didn't wake up until we arrived in Pune, so I hadn't saw nothing of the trip there at all, and I was kind of in a daze, uh, and we all were in a big crowd, and they read your names of who was going to this hotel and that hotel and so on. And I was the last in the last group to be named and we went to what was uh, a club uh, for uh, people in, and stayed in like, most of the people stayed in a motel like uh, one room after another and then there was a courtyard. And, and uh, there was a little house at the end of the space between the row of motel-like rooms and it was for men and, and uh, four or five of us were uh, staying there and three of the five of us went out really spent most of the time elsewhere and just Seymour, a man from Miami, Florida and I really stayed in there and Seymour was an older man and did his own thing. I, I obeyed all the <laughs> <laughs> the rules and and didn't know anything better and I uh, went to all the meetings and with all the group but Seymour went off and Seymour went he hired a taxi and he went to every perfect master's tomb of Baba's and got some dust from their tomb including dust from Baba's tomb so he had uh, a, a package of dust from all the perfect master's tombs and he gave me an envelope with the dust in, and I put it in my suitcase. And when I got to Kennedy Airport, oh, at this that time I was kind of hippish, and I've always liked ponytails, so I had a ponytail and a beard, and I was a glow from from uh, the, the the experience of being in India and everything, and and the inspector at the table. I uh, said, do you have anything to declare? And I said, no. You know, and he didn't believe me and went through everything. And he got to the envelope and said, what's in there? And I said, dust from the tomb of five perfect masters. And he said, yeah. <laughs> and he flipped open the envelope and the dust scattered and it went all over <laughs> the, uh, the airport room. And I never got to keep it, but the dust scattered in the United States somehow. Uh, and um, I went back, uh, well, no, I, I, I shouldn't stop there. I, we haven't gotten to the meeting yet, and so I'll get back to that. Um, the first day, I slept very long the first night, and the next morning we had breakfast, and then we got on buses and went to Guru Prasad, and we were all eager with anticipation but didn't really know what what it would be like. It was uh, a beautiful building and we went into this big room and it was a, a tiled floor and beautiful room. And at one end was Baba's chair and there was a clock above the chair and we all went in and sat on the floor and it was very quiet, just a little people rustling and we were waiting and see what would happen. We didn't know, but suddenly the clock went bing, 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 ten times. And then there was a pause. And Erich came walking in and he stood there. He didn't start immediately. He waited for a little bit. And then he said, you have kept your appointment with God. And I just, I, 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 every time I tell that, I tingle. <laughs> it was such a beautiful, meaningful thing to me. I, uh, 
I just felt that I had done what I was supposed to do and Baba knew and Baba was with us. And what happened in the re with the rest of the program that day, and I have no idea. I don't remember a single thing. Uh, I just remember that. And uh, that lasted, that feeling lasted for a long time, really. A uh, few days later, we went to, we went, uh, spent the day in Maribad. We left very early in the morning. And this was the Indian summer. Now, it was very hot. Pune was hot, but it was not too bad, really. It was like parts of America in the summer. But uh, Amin Nagar and Maribad and Merzad were really broiling. Uh, but there, there were a lot of us, a few hundred, and when we got to Baba's tomb, the, the wait to get in wasn't that long. There was no protection of uh, awning or anything like that. There, there weren't any trees, many trees on the hill then at all. It, it was very stark. Yeah, Baba's tomb was interesting, but it wasn't receptive. It was uh, stark. The inside was painted and beautiful, and when you went in, there was uh, such a presence. Uh, it was a force, not a presence. It was overwhelming, and people cried, and, and some people had to be escorted out because they were so emotional. And I felt that. Um, and I, I was sorry then that I had missed Baba. Uh, and if this was what Baba was like when he, now, what was he like when he was alive? And I, I, I thought to myself, it would have been something else to see him and be with him. But by this time, we had gone to tombs and and Baba places and. Everybody bowed down, and even uh, at the trust office in Amanagar, have you been to India? So you, you know some of these places. At the trust in, in Amanagar, there, there was a room and there was a chair in that, and someone went in to bow, to bow down to the chair. And Adi uh, said, what are you doing? What are you doing? That is not Baba's chair. That is my chair. Do not, <laughs> do not bow down to that chair. But it was also almost so automatic, people, people were doing that, really. Uh, then we went to Marizad, and it was very lovely trees and cool, and um, when we got there, there, there was a little pool about as big as this table, and it had water in that people would dip their watering cans in and then water the plants around. And I just couldn't wait. I took my shoes and socks off and, and put them in the pool to cool off. And Wendy came by, and she was wearing a Punjabi pants and tunic. And she said, oh, that looks wonderful. So she took her uh, shoes off and put her feet in and didn't realize that the bottom was kind of slimy and slippery. And she slipped right in, so she fell in the pool and was all, got all soaked and wet. <laughs> and, uh, oh no, it's the, it was really funny because she dried out very quickly. It was so hot and dry. And then we went into, um, some of us went into Baba's bedroom where he had died. And, and I was sitting uh, at the side of the room. And... When I was in Massachusetts, I got involved with a spiritual group called the Brotherhood of the Spirit. And I lived with them for a while. And at the same time, I began going to Baba meetings. And I would come back to where we were living and tell them about Baba. So they knew about Mayor Baba and my interest in it. And then they knew that Baba had dropped the body, and then they knew that I had decided to go to India anyway, and they couldn't understand that, why, why I would want to go if Baba was, was dead. And I tried to explain it to them and wasn't getting through, and a, a lot of them were kind of rough people. And I used 
the vernacular talk with them and, and eventually said, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to see the potty pissed in. I'm just going because of the love that I feel. And so they accepted that. And there I was sitting against the wall and Baba's bed was there and a few months earlier he had dropped the body there wishing that I had seen him and accepting that I wouldn't and feeling Baba's love anyway. And Mara's dog came prancing into the room, he came right over to me, lifted his leg and pissed all over me. <laughs> and then, I, in, in sort of moving around with the dog, I saw that I was sitting next to Baba's potty chair. I was sitting next to the potty piston. And immediately I saw Baba's joke. And I just thought it was great. I, you know, his sense of humor was what came through to me. But I didn't tell anybody until I got back to Pune. And uh, Seymour was there. And I told him what happened, and he saw, laughed and said, oh, that's great. I, and the next day was the last day, and we went back to Guru Prasad, and things happened, and uh, someone came up uh, to me and said, Erich wants to see you. And I said, Erich wants to see me? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I didn't know. And so I went to the men's side and went back, and Eric was there, and he gave me this great big bear hug and said, your story about the pot to piss in was great, tell it. And he pushed me out, and I, and I said, you must tell that story. So I was in front of the whole crowd, and I told the story about the potty piston and the big roar from the crowd. And it was the last day and people who had been kind of sad about going and this broke that mood immediately. And, you know, Baba knows what he's doing. <laughs> and we got on plane, uh, the planes and, and went back to America where uh, the, the envelope with the perfect dust from the perfect masters disappeared. And I went home and, and brought several uh, uh, three other people came with me to my house uh, to sort of prolong the feeling of, of the darshan and being in India and stayed for a while and, and were friends and put up with the, my uh, rather primitive home and uh, then, they, then they left. But I was there and I told all my friends that I'd been to India and uh, had a wonderful experience and um, they were very impressed and they kind of treated me like a special person and I, I, be, I, was, being, I was full of love from the experience and I loved everybody. I gave everybody I met a hug and told them about Baba and I lived in such a different kind of house than most Americans live in and we would start fires in the stove and sit on the floor and I remember one girl saying we're just sitting on the floor like this was such a strange experience but we did and, and they kept coming and uh, one day perfect summer's day uh, with some friends I went to the local lake and left a note gone to the lake be back in the evening and uh, someone at the bottom wrote missed you and signed their name by the end of the day, there were 56 names on that piece of paper that people who had come by to see me. I, I became sort of a, so I don't know what, but people really came to just sit in my house and uh, I kind of performed for them. And uh, I suppose if I had wanted to, I could have started a, being a, a guru to him or something like that, but I didn't want to do that. And I knew that Baba wouldn't want me to do that. So in the fall, uh, I had a whole group who were sitting in a circle in, in my house and in the main room, uh, and they wanted to meditate. And so I said, well, let's meditate. So we were sitting there, and I really wanted to do something else. Now, <laughs> and, but I didn't want to tell them to leave. I didn't know what to do. But 
suddenly I felt like I was up here looking down at this, and it all seemed very funny to me, and I started giggling. And of course the meditators didn't like that at all. And almost from then on, people stopped uh, coming to see me, and I wasn't, you know, the holy man or something like that, and I became kind of normal, and I cut off my beard, and chopped a little bit off my hair, and I, uh, through a friend, I became a waiter and a bartender in a local restaurant, <laughs> and had a regular job, and was a regular person again. And that's about my, just about my story of, of the, of the darshan and, and going, but then I have all the rest of my life, which can be just as interesting. But I guess the, for a few years, uh, I really concentrated uh, on being in Baba, pe with Baba people and Baba places, and I eventually came down to the center for the first time. I've been to India before I came to the center, and uh, the center was a, a beautiful place and lovely pe met f people, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, and I decided to go back to India in 1972. Uh, and I tried to, uh, to go back to being a professional and, and getting a job. And I got a few jobs in libraries uh, because I had the library degree. And I never lasted. I was always called back to my place in Heath. And I became aware that this is where Baba wanted me to be. He didn't want me to be the professional and wear a suit and tie and all that business again. And I began taking mundane jobs or regular jobs, I don't know what to call it, but I, I, be, I, I became lots of things. Um, I became, I did key punch operating in early computer days with cards and uh, I, I was a, an apple picker in the local apple harvest along with Jamaicans and they were all men who would come up and, and work for the season and go earn enough money to go back home and uh, live the rest of the year. And they were wonderful guys. I really enjoyed them. I didn't understand a lot what they said because they were speaking the, the local uh, language, their own way of speaking English, but we managed to communicate anyway. Um, and one year, uh, uh, you pick apples into sort of like a canvas bag that is a, and a strap around your neck with a, a tin support at the top, and you, you're supposed to twist the fruit to get the stem and place them in the bag and fill up the bag. And then there's a bin over here that's four by four by four. And when you get the whole bin full of apples at the time, you got $20 <laughs> for a bin. And at first I didn't get more than two or three bins a day. And well, the Jamaicans got uh, like six or seven, but I, I got better and better. And I began thinking that this, I needed so many bins to get to India. <laughs> and I, I started picking faster and faster, and I, I got quite good at it, and I did. I made enough money to buy a ticket to India and go to India from picking apples. And I did things like that, whatever came along. I worked for people uh, as the, the day person, uh, doing stuff in their gardens and whatever came along. And, and I got by and came down to the center in the wintertime because it was very cold up there and did whatever I could here in Myrtle Beach. Uh, and there wasn't a great deal of happening here in the winter. Jobs were kind of uh, few and far apart. And there weren't very many people at that time. Uh, Myrtle Beach, especially North Myrtle Beach, was almost deserted in the wintertime. There, there was one restaurant open uh, from the center to the north of, of the town, just one. 
and it wasn't really very good, but you could get coffee there and, and talk to people and so on. And we would go and have from the center or people who were living around here. We would go there and drink cup and cup and cup <laughs> of coffee until we got really jangly and talk about Baba and, and life and so on. Uh, so it was it was good living here when I when I would come here and I would go back to Massachusetts and live in my house and, and, and just eat a lot of rice and, and beans and things like that and I put in a garden. And it really was a magical place for me. Uh, one of the stories that I left out happened very early, before I ever heard Baba's name. Uh, it was Christmas time, and I was in my, in my cabin in bed, and uh, it had been a, a kind of exciting night, Christmas Eve, and I couldn't go to sleep right away. And I felt a presence at the foot of my bed. And I looked and I could see someone and I could see through them. And they were beautiful. Long hair and it, it, I didn't know what their, it looked like they were maybe uh, like were wearing a coat of feathers or something. I think it was an angel was there and I could see the angel. And, and the angel, was, the being, was smiling at me. And uh, I really didn't know what to make of it. I still don't. I don't know what it, what, what it was, but I, I got afraid and I sat up in bed and, and then the angel disappeared. But I, I felt that my place was a magical place. And other people who came there said the same thing that uh, there was a, a great feeling there uh, and things happened. I was opened up to nature and uh, I had many interesting pets. Uh, like I had a pet skunk and she was, a fe it was a female and I called her Millicent. But, and I also had pet chickens that uh, I had Casey Hen. She was uh, trained in a, a biology lab uh, by conditioned response to play baseball. And I also had a, a, a hen and a rooster. And they were uh, trained in, in a school like that too. And I accepted them as the, the re retirement home and they became very tame um, and uh, life continued that way and I went to India and met most of the Mondli uh, who were still alive and uh, I went every other year during the 70s like I went in 72, 74, 76, 78 and 81 and really got to know them well, because at first there were very few people. Uh, I remember going to the tomb and uh, I think there was no line and, and you could go right in and you could stay there almost as long as you wanted. There, very few people would, would, would come. And when we would go to Marizad, uh, we really got individual attention from the Mondali that were there. Um, and I was there on my birthday one year, which is November 19th, and someone, I was there, and Sheila Krinsky was there, and Jane Haynes was there, and me. Uh, I think Elizabeth was in the back with the ladies, and Jane was spent most of the, the day there, but, but she was staying at Vilu Villa, with, and I was there too. Uh, and. Uh, Sheila told Monty that it was my birthday. And I didn't mention it, but I, I mentioned it to Sheila, I think. And she told Monty that it was my birthday. So Monty said, happy birthday, and they sang happy birthday to me, mostly just the, the women. But then Monty said, I'll play some music for you. 
So she got out her sitar and she played uh, Raja Gantan Ropi or something like that. Anyway, it was wonderful to, uh, to hear her play and sing uh, the song about the Raja who uh, had everything and, and uh, part of the tune was that he would sit in the swing and he'd swing in luxury and he thought life was just beautiful and then he found out about death and poverty and hunger and, and was disillusioned and went on a spiritual journey. It was sort of like Buddha's story in a way. Uh, and she sang that, and I, I think Sheila put it on audio tape, and, and it still must be around somewhere, but I, I, I don't know. But it was a delightful day. I, I really got to love Mani. She was so bright and cheerful and so full of love. It was such a joy to be around her. Did you meet Mani? Get to meet Mani? Yes. And uh, Erich, of course, is just everybody's big brother, and uh, he, you felt at home. I felt at home with him from the very beginning, and, and very relaxed with him, and, and, and enjoyed his his stories in Mondley Hall. Uh, some people did not like Padre because he was kind of rough. Did you get a chance to meet him too? But I adored Padre. I just thought he was such a human person, and he he was he had very strong views. But if you had stuck to your guns, he would listen to you, and and maybe he would change his mind later. But he wouldn't show you that he was changing his mind until it was safe to do so. But I remember. Uh, I always went whenever I was there. I would always come in the evening to where he would sit in that long building where, where Muhammad Must was also. And we would sit on a bench outside and we wouldn't talk much, but uh, we would sit together. And in the evening as it descended, we would see the fruit bats flying across the the skyline from wherever, I don't know, going to some orchard someplace. I've been to the center many times and met Kitty and, and Elizabeth and got to know them some and I always found Elizabeth a little aloof, but I admired her very much because she, she was always considering what Baba would want and how to do it right and uh, she did what she, uh, she did many things for Baba, and uh, she was very reliable, and uh, that was a great thing for Baba and for for her. And I remember sitting at an event after I had been to the center many times, and and I said to her, Elizabeth, I think sometime I'd like to work on the center. And she looked at me and said, What can you do? And I said. What do you mean? She says, oh, are you a carpenter? Or uh, do you paint? Or, you know, very practical down to earth. What can you do? And I really, you know, my, I said, well, I did work in a library. And she says, oh. And, and I said, and people seem to like me. And uh, she said, well, you know, uh, people come here for Baba, not to, to see other people. And I was really put in my place then in a, a nice, kind way, but I realized well, she had a point. <laughs> and eventually I did start working on the center, and you know, ha having had that remark it really helped me that to, to re when I greeted people and saw people that they weren't here for me or what I did for them was unimportant in comparison of, of what Baba could do for them and to them when they were on the center. So I always learned something from Elizabeth. Another time I was walking down uh, the path near Del Ruba and Baba's house, and uh, this was late in Elizabeth's life, and she was walking herself on, on, uh, unaided uh, along the path. And, 
looking deep in thought, and she looked up when I appeared, and she said, you know, you're walking where your master walked, and went on, and that just, whoa, I, I just felt, there I was walking on the same path that Mayor Baba did when he was here in Myrtle Beach, and that really, uh, you get to where you forget almost that Baba physically was there and did things there, and that really brought it home, and I've never forgotten that after that. So she often said things to me that were, that just came to her that were seemingly normal, that really made a huge impression on me. And Kitty was, it's just effervescent and lovely and great fun to be with. And, and one of the things when I was working at the Gateway was I, I had to go first to Del Rube and get the money. Uh, it was in a, 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 a little plasticky leather kind of thing with a zipper on it. And at the end of the day, uh, whoever was working, would leave work first, would take it to Kitty, and I would always pick it up in the morning and take it to the gateway. I don't know why they didn't have a safe or something to put it in, but that's the way it was done then, that uh, the money always stayed in Del Ruba and you had to give it to Kitty, which I didn't mind because we would talk about what was going to happen that day, and I had a chance to talk to Kitty for a little bit before I went to work. And I remember one Christmas morning, uh, and, you know, it's, it's like, you know, people have jobs on Christmas Day and most everybody is off, but, you know, the, the gateway was open, although people didn't come and go very much, but it was still open and, and someone had to be there and someone had to w watch the gate and so on. So uh, things that went on. It, there had to be staff on the center even on Christmas Day, although we, we had breaks to go and have Christmas dinner and so on. And I went in and Kitty had the television set on and was watching uh, Nine Lessons and Carol. And she said, my brother was a choir boy at the, the, some, this chapel, which name, who's, what the name is, I've forgotten. And I said, oh, that's interesting, Kitty. Did, do you ever miss the music and, and things like that? And she said, of course I do. And I suddenly saw her as an English woman who had gone to India for Baba and then was traveling uh, when the accident occurred in Oklahoma and when they got back and Elizabeth was injured and Noreen and Machiavelli wasn't well, Baba said to her, Kitty, stay here. And she did, and she never really went back to India or uh, England or anywhere else except briefly. And all those years, uh, she had very little money. I heard from some of the people who worked at Del Ruba that she had two dresses for a long time, and uh, sort of a dress-up dress and, and a regular day dress. And she had very, very little, and yet she was so happy and cheerful and helpful and always thought of other people, and a delightful character. And I remember when Ella Winterfeld, who was living at Pine Lodge, was declining and expected to go to Baba any day or any time. And Jeff was her great friend and she really loved and trusted Jeff. And, and uh, the person who was with Ella said that they think that she was near death and uh, to call Jeff to come at the end. And, and Kitty got all excited and she called the gateway because she couldn't get in touch with Jeff. And she said, where's Jeff, where's Jeff? Get him on the Weight Watcher. <laughs> she meant the walkie-talkie, and of course I knew what she meant immediately, and I called around and Jeff roared up and it hit the center truck soon. Ella didn't die at that time, but she did soon after. Uh, but it was just delightful working with her and being around her, and uh, to realize how much 
she had given up to do what Baba wanted. Because uh, she was, a, 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 I think, a formal pianist at one time, and maybe even gave concerts in, in England, and gave you know, lessons and so on, and she, she gave that all up and uh, did what Baba wanted her to do. And uh, just, Kitty, stay here. And she did. Really amazing. So with, with that example in our mind, um, it's e easier to obey what you think Baba wants you to do. And I've been on that training path ever since I've heard of Baba. I, I really try to focus on what I, uh, sometimes what I know Baba wants me to do and, and eventually what I should do. And I was working on the center uh, and I moved a lot of stuff, junk that people collect down here to Myrtle Beach to uh, stay at the job for a long time, I thought. I was ready to stay uh, working with Jeff and uh, um, Bob Brown and Dennis on the center and really felt that Bob had opened this for me and I was committed to doing it. Um, but after six months it was over and I didn't want it to be over and I fought against it. But it, eventually I, I had to resign because I, I knew this is what Baba wanted me back in Massachusetts. And I, I finally obeyed. And I have to say that I had one trip to India that was that way too. Uh, I went with Art Kim, Arthur Kimball and uh, we went the cheapest way we could. We got a cheap flight from Kennedy to uh, London uh, that was bare bones. They served no food, no snacks, and uh, finally uh, the, the flight to Bombay went and we got on it and uh, immediately went to uh, Pune and, and then to Nagar and then to Baba's tomb. So that was the first day. The second day we went to Marizad because it was the weekend. The third day went back to Baba's tomb and then I inwardly I felt, well now you should leave. And I didn't want to leave. <laughs> I wanted to stay in, in India, Be, not just spend three days there and go. That seemed ridiculous to me. So I didn't and I had a miserable time and I didn't last very long. Baba wanted me to leave for some, I, you know, I didn't understand and I didn't want to, but eventually I had to because it became so clear to me. And when I got back to Massachusetts, a dear friend there had contracted cancer and uh, her husband had gone, to, wanted to go to Spain to sell their property there and Maria really depend she we were great friends and she depended on me to drive her around because she hated to drive and as soon as i arrived maria said don you're here uh, aldi can go to to the costa brava and sell our property and can you stay with me so i did and took care of her and the doctor told her that she was declining and she didn't have too much longer and then when Aldi came back, I uh, left and came back to Myrtle Beach. And uh, by then it was March and Maria departed this world on April Fool's Day, which I got a kick out of. And she was a great friend, another friend up, up in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And a reason why Baba wanted me to get out of India when I did, because he wanted me to do this service for Maria. They knew all about Baba and I had brought uh, them gifts from India and they weren't Baba lovers by any means but they were very open to what I was doing and uh, 
I think, you know, there's some matter there that maybe won't blossom now, but sooner or later might, you don't know.